Good evening, everyone. Uh, I warmly welcome all of you to Natya Kata, a session uh, sharing the stories of uh, divine beings, or we can call them demigods. This session is truly inspired by dance and will be presented by my intermediate Bharatanatyam students of Aksarazas. So this particular um, group of young talents has started their training as a Bala Bharatam student under the guidance of uh, Ms. Seema Harikumar at Aksaraz Arts. I think over the years, um, they have been working really hard and developed themselves as a very um, serious and committed students of Bharatanatyam. So in this moment, I proudly introduce uh, them. They're the speakers of their own work today. Um, maybe the speakers can just wave your hands. Um, Madhumita Abhirami Kumarasami, Purnima Mohanti, Swara Paresh Prabhu Shastri, Maya Sharma, Meenakshi Nair, Anahita Biswas, Naisa Teres Mathev. So before we begin uh, the presentation, a brief introduction about demigods. In Hinduism, the term demigod is used to refer to the embodiment of half god and half animal form. Some of the demigods are an avatar of a particular deity or a saint who ultimately became the mortal divine soul in heaven, who were the seekers of love for God. These demigods denote the teaching of Hinduism and their attributes are epitomized the bhakti or devotion. As we learn in Hinduism, a demigod is defined as a deity or God who was once mortal so does Greek and Roman mythology also share of demigods, which might excite us, maybe enable us to learn more about who are these demigods, where they come from, and what is their origin, and what do they share with the mythological uh, Indian and other mythological stories. So with that brief introduction, I shall invite our first presenter, Naisa. screen. So I'm Naisa and today I'll be sharing about Sukarishi. Okay, so um, Sukarishi is the son of the Rishi Veda Vyasa and his wife Pinjla. If you didn't know, Veda Vyasa is the legendary author of the Mahabharata, Vedas and Puranas, which are some of the most important works in the Hindu tradition. The word Sukha means perfect memory. And with a perfect memory, he was actually able to recite the entire Bhagavadam without any omissions. He is often depicted with a green parrot head, and he is said to have a very pleasing personality. He easily attracted everyone with his appearance. So here's a picture of Veda Vyasa and some other illustrations of Sukharishi. So Sukarishi's birth. Sukarishi, some texts mention that Sukarishi was in his previous birth, the parrot of Radha during the Krishna Avatara, who used to carry messages from Radha to her Lord Krishna. When it was time for Radha to depart from this world, the parrot wanted to go along with her. However, Radha told the parrot to stick around, ensuring him that he wouldn't miss her because whenever the story of Radha and Krishna would be told, he would feel her presence there. His mission would be to propagate the Srimad Bhagavadam. So one day, the parrot, in his wanderings, happens to hear the Harikatha being told by Shiva to Parvati. For reference, the Harikatha is a form of Hindu traditional discourse in which the storyteller usually explores a traditional theme, and in this case, the Srimad Bhagavadam. Sukarishi, the parrot, hides amongst the leaves to hear the stories. So somewhere in the middle, Parvati dozed off, and Sukarishi, in the assumption that Shiva might stop the narration, made humming sounds in place of Parvati. So when Parvati eventually woke up and apologized to Shiva for dozing off, he was left confused as to who was humming in place of her. Shiva looked around to find Sukarishi hidden amongst the leaves. Angered that a mere parrot had the audacity to listen to the Bhagavadam, Shiva chased him with a trishula with the intention to kill. The parrot entered the mouth of Pinjala, who happened to be yawning at the very same time. It is said that Sukarishi turned into a baby 
and was in the womb of his mother for about 16 years in comparison to the normal nine months. So um, Sukharishi lived a life of Digambara. He walked around in bare minimum as he had little to no consciousness about his body. Sukharishi was a realized soul by birth and was said to be greater than Vedavyasa himself. He had attained oneness with nature very early on in his life to the extent that whenever Veda Vyasa called out for him, nature itself was said to have responded to his call. Such was his greatness. Sukharishi had access to all the worlds, all the lokas. However, he was once denied entry at the Vishnu Loka as he did not have a guru. So when Sukharishi was in search for a guru to enter the Vishnu Loka, his father, Veda Vyasa, pointed him to King Janaka. King Janaka was one of the noblest saints in his time. However, Sukharishi doubted and judged the king. He couldn't understand how someone like King Janaka, who was so invested in worldly affairs, responsibilities, and duties, could be a guru. Janaka wanted to test Sukharishi before initiating him as a student. So the king gave him a cup of oil and asked him to walk around the kingdom. However, if even a single drop of oil was spilt, then his head would be cut off by the soldiers walking behind him. So King Janaka made sure to arrange for a lot of distractions in his route. Because Sukharishi's desire for realizing God and wanting to get the initiation from him was very strong, he managed to reach the palace without spilling anything. Upon his return, the king told him that while his mind was ready for concentration, he lacked humility. The king asked him to go back to his father and come back when he was humbler. Disappointed, Sukharishi went back to his father. Veda Vyasa asked Sukharishi to repent for the criticisms and judgments he had of the king. To prove his humility, Sukharishi waited for 12 years at the garbage dump of the king's palace, letting the garbage fall on him. The king, extremely pleased at, pleased at his determination and devotion, initiated him as a student. So here are some visuals of uh, King Janaka and Sukharishi. So Sukharishi is also the sage who recited the Bhagavadam and taught the greatness of Bhakti to the Kuru king, Parikshit, grandson of Arjuna, when he was cursed to die within seven days of a snake bite. Parikshit was at the banks of the Ganges, surrounded by sages when 16-year-old Sukharishi appeared to them and recited the entire Srimad Bhagavadam to, the, to him without any omissions. So uh, Sukharishi uh, eventually achieved moksha. He was a parama yogi who was a realized soul at a very young age. As a person full of spiritual wisdom, Sukharishi inspires us to be humble and tells us to lead lives of simplicity and respect. He teaches us to focus on our spiritual selves rather than the distracting worldly objects. As dancers especially, I personally think that Sukharishi inspires us to be patient and resilient with our practice, as well as our pursuit to become better dancers every single day. So um, thank you for listening, and thank you Priyansa and Apsarazats for the opportunity. Hi everyone, um, thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to speak about uh, my demigod Garuda. Um, so Garuda is a demigod. He is the Vahana of Lord Vishnu. So Garuda represents a uh, birth in heaven and he is an enemy of all snakes. Uh, he has a mix of human and eagle-like features. So I'm going to tell you a little story about how Garuda became Vishnu's Vahana. So Garuda lived with his father Kashyap, a great sage, and his mother Vinata, the daughter of King Daksha. One day, Garuda's mom, Vinata, decided she wanted to go meet her sister Kadru. Kadru always didn't like Garuda, as she was the mother of serpents, and Garuda ate many snakes. So Kadru plotted a plan and managed to trick Vinata into becoming her slave. Garuda was furious at this news and went to Kadru's place and begged her to free his mother. So, after asking, um, so Kadru said, if you give me the Amrita, I will free your mother. So after asking his mother where the Amrita was and asking his father for a bit of help, 
He defeated all the barriers that stopped him from getting the Amrita and got it. While he was on his way back to Kadru's den, Vishnu came and told him, I've been looking for you, looking at you very closely, and I'm surprised you've not kept the Amrita for yourself. Please go free your mother, but make sure that Kadru and all the serpents don't drink the Amrita. Garuda happily agreed to this and went and freed his mother and placed the Amrita back. Vishnu was so happy with Garuda and how powerful he was that Vishnu decided to make Garuda his, bah his Bahana. So what are the different names of Garuda? So Garuda actually has many different names, such as uh, Chirada, Gaganeshvara, Kamayusha, Tatsya, Vyanatya, and Kashyapi. But um, the most earliest mention of Garuda was in the Vedas, and his name was Sayana. And it was written that the mighty bird was responsible for bringing nectar to the earth from the heaven. So it said that he brought the Amrita or Soma, the nectar of life, to earth. So what is Garuda's powers? So Garuda is a protector with the power to swiftly go everywhere. He's ever watchful and an enemy of all serpents. So Garuda in Southeast Asia. So Garuda is actually the national emblem of Indonesia and Thailand. Um, Garuda is the national emblem of Indonesia because it symbolizes strength and power and the gold symbolizes greatness and glory. So why is Garuda the national emblem of Thailand? So Garuda is a national emblem of Thailand because the ancient kings believed in divine kingship. They considered themselves as an incarnation of God Narayana. Thus, Garuda came to symbolize the divine power and authority of the kings. So this is Garuda in a Thai temple. So uh, in a temple in Thai Thailand, Garuda is seen to be stepping on a naga slash snake. But the Thai believe that Garuda isn't killing the naga. Collectively, the Naga and the Garuda are forming a balance between the sky, earth, rain, and sunlight. So this is a statue of Garuda in Bali. So uh, this statue is a Vishnu riding Garuda, which weighs around 3,000 kgs and is approximately 120 meters tall and has a wingspan of 64 meters. So in conclusion, Garuda is a mighty and powerful bird who symbolizes knowledge and power and is the vehicle Sashvahana of Vishnu. He has many temples across India and is widely known in the Hindu community of Indonesia and Thailand. Thank you for listening. So today I am going to be talking about Nandi, a very famous demigod. So who is Nandi? He is one of the most iconic characters in Hindu mythology. He is half human, half bull, demigod, and he is adorned in ornate clothing and jewelry with flowers, a crown, and garlands. So I know there are a lot of youngsters among us, so I got a little anim animation from YouTube for them to watch, and I'll narrate the story about how Nandi was born on top of it. So a long time ago, uh, there was a great sage named Shilada. He was, he had no children, so he was really sad. And he yearned for one child. So he decided to pray to the great Lord Shiva. He prayed for thousands of years to come very patiently. And Lord Shiva, satisfied, appeared before him and asked him to open his eyes. What is it that you want, O great sage? Shilada then replied with, I only want one thing, and that is a child. Lord Shiva then comforted the great sage and told him to return home. A child he will get as quickly as possible. The sage then returned home happy since he trusted his Lord and he will have a child. The next morning, he wanted to continue his farming and plowing. When he saw a beautiful boy before him, he shined as brightly as the sun and a voice beckoned him saying, this is your child Shilada, take him home and raise him well with great care. The boy was raised and his name was Nambi. 
Now, this is the second part of the story about how he became a bull because he looks very human here. Nandi, so a few days later, two great sages named Sage um, Varna and Sage Mitra came to Shilada's home and sought some rest and rest they were given. Shilada then asked Nandi to give great care and love to these special guests. Nandi then went on to obey his father and attended to every need these two sages had. When the day came, they had to leave. They went on to give their blessings. First to Shilada, they said, you may have a long, prosperous, and happy life. But to Nandi, they looked slightly sad and just advised him to respect his gurus and be good. Sage Shilada then noticed this and became very worried. He went on to ask these two sages, what is the problem with my son? Is there something wrong? The two sages then had to explain about how Nandi had not very long to live. He was destined to die at the age of eight. But the sage Shilada got really devastated because he just got him. And you guys know how much he yearned for a child. And he didn't know what to do. The sages then comforted him saying, it's his destiny. Nothing can change it. It is fate. Now here, Shilada returned home to Nandi and told him this devastating news. But to his surprise, Nandi did not cry, did not wail in anger. He laughed at this news. He said, you must not listen to these two sages. My fate can be reversed. And it can be reversed by the one person you prayed to for those thousands of years. Lord Shiva, he is the great God. He can reverse my fate. I will pray as hard as you did for thousands of years to come and I will be immortal. The great sage finally understood these words and was overjoyed. He then went on to bless his son. Be victorious, my son, and return home. Nandi then went on to River Bhuvana, where he began his penance. He prayed very compassionately and diligently. And the Lord did appear before him. He asked him to open his eyes. What is it that you want, my dear child? Nandi realized that he was the most beautiful God he had ever seen. And he had only one wish in his heart now, and that is to be with him forever. So he went on to say, Oh Lord, I wish to be with you always, for eternity. Please give me this wish. Lord Shiva, pleased, said, I have just lost my bull, my vehicle. So you will have to have the face of a bull and you will live in my home, Mount Kailash, and you will be my companion, the head of the Ganas, Shiva's servants, and be my friend. So this is how Nandi was half bull and half man and he became a demigod. And you know how he had a great devotion for Lord Shiva? This is one of the stories which proves his loyalty. When um, 
the churning of the great ocean was happening, the snake king Vasuki was used as a rope and the poison spewed out of him. And to prevent this from harming all life, Shiva had to drink the poison. Some of it spilled out while his throat turned blue. To save his master and all life, Nandi drank the spilled venom. And to, his, to everyone's surprise, he survived it. And even, even when Lord Shiva was struggling to drink all of it, and this shows how the protection of Lord Shiva was so great. And these are some interesting facts. Um, Nandi, later on, Nandi had cursed Ravana saying that a monkey would set fire on your kingdom. And that monkey turned out to be Hanuman. He set Ravana's kingdom on fire. And Nandi is one of the deities whose instrument choices is the Mridangam. He is said to have played the Mridangam for Lord Shiva during the Tandav. And it is set to cause a divine rhythm all across the heavens. Thank you for listening and devoting your time for me. So today I'm going to be talking about Narha Simha, which is part lion and part man. So this is the contents page. So first I'll be talking about the introduction. Then I'll be giving you a little background story and some facts some facts I learned about Narasimha. And then thirdly, I'll be showing you a video which talks about the story of Narasimha. So let's start with the introduction. Narasimha, which is in Sanskrit, Nara and Simha. It, Nara means man and Simha means lion. So this means that he has the head of a lion and a body of a man. So Narasimha was the fourth avatar of Vishnu. And Vishnu was able to kill Hiranyakasha in the form of Narasimha. Narasimha is primarily known as the great protector who specifically defends and protects his devotees from evil. So here's a picture of Narasimha. And as you can see, his head is a face of a lion and he has a body of a man. So background story. So um, when, while I was um, researching about Narasimha, I learned that Hiranyakasha and his brother Hiranyaksha were previously Devtas and were huge devotees of Lord Vishnu, known as Jay and Vijay. The entire reason why they came to hate Vishnu was due to a curse given by Brahmasan, known as the Four Kumars, who wanted to, who wanted to pray to um, Lord Vishnu but were unable to because Jay and Vijay stopped them. So, um, for the four Kumars actually cursed uh, um, Jay and Vijay to live in the mortal world. So Vishnu tried making the curse less severe by giving them two options. They could either spend three of their births as Vishnu's enemy or they could spend seven of their births as his devotee. So Vijay and Jay decided to spend three births as Vishnu's enemy so that they could return to Lord Vishnu as soon as possible. So the three um, reincarnations they were, um, they were uh, in the body of on earth was Hiranyaksha, Hiranyaksha, uh, Hiranyaksha, Ravana and Kumbhakarna, which is found in the Ramayana, and Shishupala and Danta Vakra, which are found in the Mahabharata. So now I'll be talking about, now I'll be showing you a video which talks about the story of Narasimha. Narsimha Avataram story. Dashavataram refers to the ten major incarnations of Lord Vishnu. Lord Vishnu incarnates on earth from time to time to eradicate forces to restore karma. Narsimha Avatara is the fourth avatara of Lord Vishnu. Narsimha Avatara is also mentioned in Padma Purana's Uttarakhanda. Now let us go to know in detail about the incarnation of Lord Vishnu as Narasimha. Agri Hiran Kasipu, 
led his army of asuras to attack lord indra and everyone in heaven every time he fought he lost the battle later he realized that lord vishnu was always there to help them and so he decided hirana kasipu says if i have to defeat vishnu then i should have special powers to protect myself i will pray to lord brahma he is the creator if i pray for a long time lord brahma will even grant me boon of immortality you think so here are kasipu who left the jungle and started his exactly during this time lord indra attacked hiran kasipu's son and defeated them lord indra then decided to imprison hiran kasipu's pregnant wife gayadu gayadu was trembling with fear and escaped to narada muni's ashram Kayadu was welcomed in Rishi Narada's ashram. She was taken care of very well. She was told many stories of Lord Vishnu and unborn baby too enjoyed listening to the stories of Lord Vishnu. Later she gave birth to a beautiful boy Prahlad in Rishi Narada's ashram. Lord Brahma noticed Hiran Kasipu's penance and was touched to see his devotion. Lord Brahma says, "Get up, dear son. Your penance has been divine, and thus I have come here to grant you the boon you wish." Hiran Kasipu says, "My Lord, I wish to be immortal." Lord Brahma says. Son, all who are born have to die. I cannot change the laws of nature. Please ask something else. Hiran Kasipu was unhappy, but he thought for a while and later asked, "Lord, I wish that I should neither be killed by a man, nor by animal or God Himself. Neither should I be killed during the day or night. I must not be killed in heaven nor earth." neither inside the house nor outside no weapons must be used to kill me hiran kasipu asked very smartly lord brahma yeah. could not say no it looks like it's a sharing of asked by hiran kasipu hiran kasipu joyed no bound when he got this food but his joy did not last long as soon as he came back to the kingdom He was furious to see that Lord Indra had attacked his kingdom. He first searched for his wife and happily brought her home along with his son Prahlad. Days passed by. Hiran Kasipu noticed his son was different from him. He was always preaching Lord Vishnu, saying Narayana, Narayana. He did not like this behavior, and spoke to him. Hiran Kasipu says, "Dear sir, what have you learnt in your school?" Prahlad says, "Father, I have learnt that Vishnu, the Lord, is the ruler of these three worlds. If we are devoted to Him, He will always be there for us." Hiran Kasipu tried various ways to change Prahlad's mind, but all went in vain. Prahlad had become an ardent devotee of Lord Vishnu. Finally, he called his sister Holika, who had a boon that she will not get burned even if she sits on burning pyre. Hiran Kasipu ordered Holika to take Prahlad in her lap. Hiran Kasipu says, "He is no son of mine. I want you to take Prahlad in your lap and hold him tight, so that when I both set you on fire, he would." Hiran Kasipu had underestimated the power of devotion because considering him to be the most powerful but Lord Vishnu was there to save his little devotee Prahlad was just thinking about his lord and paid no attention to whatever was going around him 
To everyone's surprise, Holika started burning and little one sat unmoved. Hiran Kasipu's had lost and gained and he would not accept his defeat. He yelled, You always say that Lord Vishnu saves you. Tell your Vishnu to come in front of me and fight with me. Let me also see his powers. Saying so, he kicked the pillar and shouted, Where is he? Hiran Kasipu was shocked to see something inside the pillar. What was that? He exclaimed. It had face of the lion and body of a man. Seeing Hiran Kasipu, it bellowed loudly. I am Narsimha, the avatar of Narayana, and I have come here to kill you. Narsimha caught him tight and dragged him to the threshold of the door, neither inside nor outside of the house, and placed him on his lap, neither sky nor the earth, and there killed him. Hiran Kasipu with his claws, without weapons. Bilhad's belief in Lord Vishnu was... Uh, so that was the story of how Narasimha killed Hiranyakasha. So now I'll be talking about some extra things which weren't mentioned in the video. So after killing Hiranyakasha, Narasimha was even more furious and he began to destroy everything and all the demons in his path. No one could stop him since they were terrified of his fury. So all the devtas went to Brahma and Brahma said and advised the gods to present Prahlada in front of Narasimha. At the sight of his devotee, Narasimha immediately calmed down. And later on, his victory was worshipped as, as he had defeated Hiranyakasha, the one who dominated both heaven and earth. And I wanted to add in a little note. So one of the reasons why Hiranyakashyap also hated Vishnu was due to the fact that, um, that uh, the previous avatar of Vishnu, known as Varaha, had actually killed his brother, Hiranyakaksha. So there are other versions of the story where they talk about how Narasimha was subdued and calmed down by different people. So first was Prahlada, as I mentioned before. Second one was Goddess Lakshmi, and the third one was Sharaba. Sharaba is the avatar of Shiva, who is part lion and part bird beast. He is eight-legged and more powerful than a lion or an elephant, and he possesses the ability to clear a valley in one jump. In later literature, Sharaba was also described as an eight-legged deer. So here are some pictures showing Sharaba subduing Narasimha. As you can see, it's, uh, there's a picture of, um, picture of Sharaba and near his foot is uh, Narasimha. And the other picture shows Prahlada helping to calm down uh, Narasimha. I hope you really enjoyed this presentation. Thank you for listening and hopefully you learn more about Narasimha. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, today, to explain my demigod, um, uh, Kamadenu, I'm going to have a puppet show. And uh, Kamadenu is going to be the one who is going to be telling you her story. What? Sorry, 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 give me a second. Hello, everybody. I am Kamadenu. I am the celestial cow that grants wishes to everybody. You ask me something and I will grant it to you. I provide food and milk for every being. As you can see, there are many gods on my body. All of these gods reside in me. There are at least 330 million gods inside me. So praying to a cow or praying to me is like praying to 330 million gods. And since the gods are in me, the Trinity is also in my horns. Brahma is the tip, the middle is Vishnu, and the base is Shiva. My eyes are the sun and the moon. My shoulders are Agni and Vayu, and my four legs are the Vedas. During the Satya Yuga, which was the first Yuga, I was standing on four legs. During the Treta Yuga, I was standing on three legs. And during the Dwapar Yuga, I was standing on only two legs. And now, unfortunately, during the Kali Yuga, I am standing on one leg. And you may presume that this is because that all of the values that are taught in the Vedas 
have now disappeared from humans and they have become bad as the yugas progress and so i'm only standing on one leg so this is a little bit about me about how i was born there are many many stories but i'm going to tell you the three main legends of how i was created so the first legend and which this this legend is the most common one is the samudra mantra which is known as the churning of the ocean where the devas and the asuras were churning mount meru to get the nine celestial objects from it one of the objects that had come out was the elephant airavat who is the vahana of lord indra the second was goddess lakshmi who also came out obviously the pot of amrita also came out which was the main thing which they were planning to get and another thing that came out was me and as you can see in this form i have a human a lady's face wings and a tail the reason why i have a tail i mean sorry the reason why i have wings and a tail is for me to fly through all the lokes i can fly through the brahma lok shiva lok vaikund mrityu lok and patar lok and you will find out why later so the second legend of how i was born starts in brahma lok where brahma was drinking a pot of amrita and because he had drank so much amrita he started to burp and out of his breath i had come so you can technically say that brahma is my father so the third story which is not a very old story but comes from the bhagavad purana states it states that i was born from our dear very dear cowherd known as krishna so one day krishna and his lover radha were in the forest of vrindavan when they were thirsty for milk so from the left side of krishna i had emerged and so krishna started to milk me and as he was taking his pot of milk he had accidentally dropped it on the floor and that milk that had spilled on the floor had become the shiv sagar known as the milky ocean in which lord vishnu sleeps in not only that many other cows and calves had started to come out of me and because krishna was a cowherd he had given it to his other cowherd friends and gopikas so these are the three main stories of how kamadenu was born of course there are many other legends one of them is that i was the daughter of prajapati dutch who is also sati's father and in that was stated in the mahabharat and in the ramayana it states that i was the daughter of sage kashipa and his wife and in the matsya purana it says that i was not sage kashipa's daughter i was in fact his wife so there are many stories we don't know which one is the real one but you know it's nice to know so the reason why i have these wings as i told you earlier so i can fly, fly through all the lokas we know why i was in brahma lok because i came out of brahma's breath but but why was i in shiva lok in and in mrityu lok so the reason why i was in shiva lok i was in shiva lok because one day i wanted to do an abhishekam for lord shiva so i had gone to mount kailash which is where he lives and so i had placed a shivalinga underneath my others and as the milk had started to flow it had done an abhishekam for lord shiva and there is even a statue in batu cave which is in malaysia that shows this the, sh the shivalingam under my others the reason why i am in mrityu lok which is earth was the fact that i had once sa saved sage vashishta's life who is known as lord ram's teacher and so he had kept me in his ashram and hence i was in mrityu lok 
And why I'm in Patharlog, which is underneath the earth, was because I am related to Bhumi Devi. So these are a few reasons as to why I fly all over the nodes. And these are some facts about how I was born. And so I hope you really enjoyed my stories. And you should always remember that you should not be eating beef because, well, when you're a child, your mother feeds you milk. And when you grow up, I feed you milk and every cow does. So if you kill me and eat me, it's equivalent to eating and killing your mother, which of course you wouldn't want. So this is why you guys shouldn't eat beef and this is why you should support every single cow that is there on earth. And that is why cows are free in India as well. So thank you and I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Good evening everyone. Today I'll be talking about um, the demigod Hayabiva. He is an incarnation of Lord Vishnu. Okay. Uh, so uh, here's a little description of Hayabiva. He has um, a horse head and a blue body. He wears white clothing and sits on a white lotus. He has four hands. One bestows knowledge and another one holds books of wisdom. And the other two hold a conch and a discus. So here's the story of how Lord Vishnu became Hayagriva. A long time ago, Lord Vishnu, who was also known as Janardana, had waged a war lasting 6,000 years with the Asuras. At the end of the battle, he went to sleep in a standing posture while his head su was supported by the tip of his bow. When the devas and the divine sages saw this, they were very worried. They thought to themselves, who would protect the world if the great protector was asleep? Even Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva were concerned about Lord Vishnu. Lord Shiva turned to Lord Brahma and he told him to let one of, Lord Brahma, one of his creations, a tiny beetle, eat the bowstring from the bottom. When the bow recoils, the noise will wake Lord Vishnu up. So Lord Brahma commanded the insect to break the bowstring. When the string broke, the bow snapped with a noise that sounded like the end of the world. Everyone around was frightened by it. All creation started to act in a weird and different manner. When the devas went to check on Lord Vishnu, they saw that the bow tip had beheaded him. They were surprised. Only his lifeless torso stood there. Lord Brahma told the gods that the only thing they could do in this situation was to pray to Devi, as she is the only one who can give them the right advice. Hence, all the devas started to pray to Shakti. They chanted and praised her. Here's the picture of Hayagriva and Lord Brahma. So finally, after a long time, Shakti heard their prayers and told them that there was a reason why she caused Vishnu's head to be cut off from his body. And she told them the story of the Asura, Hayagriva. So a long time ago, there was a great Asura king named Hayagriva, who performed a great penance directed to, uh, directed to Shakti on the banks of the river Saraswati. When she appeared before him, he asked for immortality. And when she told him it was impossible, he asked for a boon where he could only be killed by a creature with a horse face. So she decided that Lord Vishnu should kill him. She instructed Lord Brahma to fit Lord Vishnu's body with a horse head. So here are some uh, different versions of how Hayagriva is depicted. Uh, in some versions, he has a white uh, horse head and a blue body, but in some versions, he has uh, a full blue body. So Lord Brahma beheaded um, a horse with a sword. He then fitted the head of the horse onto Lord Vishnu. Lord Vishnu was transformed into a wondrous creature with the body of a man and the head of a horse. He was known as Hayagriva as well. 
At the end of the vicious battle, Lord Vishnu's form of Hayabhiva killed the Asura Hayabhiva. Thank you for listening to my um, presentation. I hope you all enjoyed it. So I'm Maya and I'll be presenting um, Rahu, uh, talking about Rahu and Ketu. So I've, I'm sorry. So I've created a short four minute video on the story of Rahu and Ketu. Hi, my name's Maya. Have you ever heard your grandmother sing, it's Rahu Kal, don't start a new project, it will fail. Or heard her say, to remain happy and positive is the best remedy for Ketu. And wondered what she meant? Well, this is your chance to find out. It's through the Samudra Mantan, or the churning of the ocean, that Rahu and Ketu came into existence. The Devas and Asuras both wanted the special Amrit that was at the very bottom of the Milk Sea. So they worked together and churned the sea using the Serpent King Vasuki as a rope, Mount Mandar as a stick to move the churn, and Vishnu's Kurma Avatar as the base of it. The first thing that came out of the sea was deadly poison and no one wanted to handle it. So they requested Lord Shiva to consume it. Lord Shiva swallowed the poison but held his neck so he couldn't get to his body. That's how he got the name Neokan, Lunak. After that, another 14 things came out of the sea. A few of them were Kamadenu, the sacred cow, Danmantri who brought Ayurveda to our world, the flowers of Parijat, and lastly came the most awaited plot of Amrit. Once the Amrits came out, the Devas and Asuras were elated, but that didn't last for long as they now had to decide who would consume it. To stop the argument, Lord Vishnu intervened and took the form of a beautiful lady named Mohini. The Devas and Asuras were equally enchanted by Mohini. They would do anything for her. Mohini asked them to give her the pot of nectar and said she would distribute it to everyone equally. She told everyone to sit down in a line and only then would she distribute it. So the devas sat down in a line and the asuras thereafter. Mohini started distributing the nectar and the idea was to finish it before it reached the asuras. But there was one asura called Swaravanu who figured out that there was something fishy going on and that the demons were being tricked. So while Mohini was distributing the Amrit, he quickly snuck in and sat in between Surya and Chandra. Mohini came to Swarabhanu and gave him some nectar, but Surya and Chandra figured out that there was a demon sitting in between them. So they went and complained to Mohini, and Mohini sliced Swarabhanu's throat using her Sudarshan chakra. Since Swarabhanu drank some of the Amrit, he wasn't dead. His body and head still functioned. They just weren't attached to each other. The head was called Rahu, and the body was called Ketu. The daughter of Hiranyakashi also considered as the mother of Swarabhanu, nurtured his head and got a snake body, while the body of Swarabhanu was nurtured by a Brahmin named Mini. Lord Vishnu granted a serpent head to the servant body of Swarabhanu and granted him a boon that he will travel above the sun. Due to this, Rahu and Ketu always treat Surya and Chandra as their natural enemies and cause solar and lunar eclipses. Rahu makes the moon wax and wane on a daily basis and causes lunar eclipses, while Ketu causes solar eclipses. That is the story of Rahu and Ketu. And then we started to believe that Rahu and Ketu are real planets, and as a result, they became part of Navagraha. Navagraha is the nine celestial bodies of the universe, and the nine astronomical bodies as well as deities in Hinduism and Hindu astrology. The term is derived from Nava meaning nine and Graha meaning planet. Rahu and Ketu are not real planets, they're just imaginary planets. When the moon crosses the path of the sun, also known as Ravimar, the northern point of intersection is called Rahu, or the north node of the moon. When it travels south, the point of intersection is called Ketu, or the south node. Rahu and Ketu are intersection points of the moon and the sun, and nothing more. 